Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'd like to describe an escape room puzzle I made, which I've called Split Audio. I often think that too much attention is given to visual puzzles, and I like puzzles that incorporate other senses too. This one is all about listening to a recorded audio message that's been split up into pieces. And what players need to do is line those pieces up and play them back at the same time to recreate the original message. It's kind of the audio equivalent of one of those puzzles where you have a message written across several pieces of transparent acetate that you need to overlay on top of each other. So let me show you how it works. Players find various electronic devices around the room. Now these could be fixed in place or they could be portable like this one. And each of these devices has a button on it which when pressed plays back an audio recording through the speaker. But it's only a partial recording. There are parts of the message that are muted, muffled, missing or obscured by noise. The code for the lock is one, three, now, there are also other similar devices that contain the same audio recording but with different fragments missing. And in order to hear the complete message, players need to find two, three or more of these devices and play them back simultaneously so that all the audio fragments line up. The code for the lock is one, two, three, four, from right to left. Now, you could theme this puzzle to fit in with many different escape room scenarios. In a wartime themed room, these fragments could represent where a jamming signal had blocked a radio transmission. Or in a space station, this could be a corrupted audio file of the captain's log. Uh, in a spy themed escape room, this could be the recordings made by various bugging devices placed in different positions each of which only captures a fraction of the audio as the target moves around the room. Uh, it's pretty simple to make, it only requires a few electronic components and unusually for one of my projects, absolutely no coding. Uh, so let me show you how you can make this yourself. So let's start by taking a look at the electronic hardware. So this is a view from the inside of the device and you can see the components laid out there. And the most important component is this GPD2846 MP3 player in the middle. Now, I've got loads of different audio modules in my parts drawer, which I've used in different electronics projects. I've got um, DF player minis, I've got serial MP3 players, I've got various audio boards from Adafruit and Robert Sonics. Um, but this is the one which I'm using in this project. And compared to the other modules here, it doesn't have any kind of fancy interface. You can't trigger playback of a particular sound effect from a button or control it from serial commands sent from an Arduino. Its behavior is really very basic. When it's powered up, it immediately starts playing any MP3 or WAV files that are saved on the SD card here. And then it loops continuously through all the files on the card, playing them back one after another forever. So it's got very limited functionality compared to most of these other boards, but it's actually got exactly the behavior we want for this particular project. It's got a 2 watt amplifier on board, which is not very powerful, but it's loud enough to hear speech, and you can connect a speaker directly to the two pins at the edge of the board here. So I've connected a basic half watt eight ohm speaker similar to you might find in a cheap radio or an electronic toy. So the audio you hear is hardly going to be studio quality, it's quite tinny. But for this particular application, that's actually a good thing because we're not trying to use this device to create an in-game diegetic sound effect. Players know that they're listening to an audio recording and the tinny quality of the playback actually accentuates that fact. So to make the audio play, we simply need to provide power to this module here. And to do that, I'm using four AA batteries in this battery pack, which will provide about five volts. Now, if you prefer, you could use a single 3.7 volt LiPo battery instead. 
and I'm running the positive wire from that battery pack through into a micro switch which is plugged into the back of the arcade button here. Now I've got the positive line going into the common terminal of that micro switch and then I've got the normally open terminal going through to the positive input on the GPD module and then I've got the grounds of the power and the GPD connected together. Now because this is the normally open input when the button is not being pressed like this there is a break in the circuit between these two terminals they're not connected so no current is going to flow. When the button is pressed down on the front these little white tabs come down and they press down on the little button on the arcade switch here. That closes the contacts between these two terminals forming a complete circuit. Now current flows through the audio module and it starts playing back sound files from the card. Now you'll see the other thing that happens when I press that button down is that this LED lights up here. Now it's always nice to give some kind of positive feedback to confirm when any input has been made anyway but one of the particular reasons I wanted to include an LED behind the button in this project is because there can be a slight delay after pressing the button before the audio playback starts. Now the exact length of that delay seems to vary slightly, it's about half a second and I think it depends on the power that is available when the unit powers up. So one thing I'd recommend is if you are powering it via batteries as I am doing here, make sure that all of your devices, when you change the batteries, change all of the batteries at the same time, that will ensure that they've got a fresh set and that the same amount of charge is being received by each module. So that will help keep them in sync with each other. If you're powering this from a main supply, that's unlikely to be an issue, so you don't have to worry about it. Now, these micro switches often come with LEDs supplied with them, but if they do, those LEDs are normally designed to run at 12 volts. So if I just show you how that's wired in, if I push that out, here we've got the LED which is inserted into the top of the micro switch and it's simply got its legs twisted around these little plastic wings at the bottom. I'm going to try to undo those. And then if I pull the LED out, so when this comes supplied what you'll probably find is that it will be an LED with a uh, quite a high resistor there because it's designed to run at 12 volts. If you're supplying 5 volts like we are here what I've done is instead is I've soldered a 220 ohm resistor onto one of the legs of the LED instead and then you can just push that through the base of the plastic housing there and then you need to wrap the legs just back around these little wings here so that when you push this back into the top of the housing at the top of the switch you see there's some sort of metal contacts there and that's going to form a circuit through the LED like that. I can manage to push that back in. There we go. Make sure you push it back in the right way around, obviously, because LEDs only have current flow uh, one way through them. Um, and then you, you screw that back into the button like that. So that now it illuminates when you press it from the front. Um, now, just in case that wiring was uh, a little bit hard to follow, let me show you a diagram of this, how it's all connected in Fritzing. And hopefully this makes those connections a little bit clearer to see what's going on. So I've got my battery pack here, which is going through my arcade micro switch. This is the normally open connection. And then I've got that going both to the audio module here and through this LED. I've got my speaker connected, the speaker connectors of the GPD module there. And there's not really much more to say about this. So uh, just a few things to comment on. Firstly, I said I've got four batteries here giving me around 5 volts. Now you might think, well an AA battery is 1.5 volts, isn't it? And although that's the nominal voltage of an AA battery, in practice that voltage goes down as the battery discharges and it's normally only going to give out 1.1 to 1.2 volts, something like that. So if you connect four of them in series, as I have done here, that will give you about 5 volts, which is what I want for this project. And then the 
LED here, you notice I've connected that in a parallel circuit. I haven't connected it in line in this red line here that's going to the audio module, rather I've got sort of a, a branch line and it's connected down here. The reason for that is because I don't want the LED and the GPD to have to share voltage between them. I want the GPD to draw as much current as it needs at the full voltage supplied by the batteries. And I also want the LED to draw as much current as it needs, limited by this resistor here, from the batteries as well. If I were to connect them in series, what would happen is that they'd have the same amount of current passing through them both, and the voltage would be split between them. That's a series circuit. In a parallel circuit like this, they're both able to get the full amount of voltage of the batteries, and they just draw as much current as each component needs. So the next thing we need to do is to prepare our audio files and for that I'm using software called Audacity. Audacity is really excellent open source software you can use for all sorts of audio recording and processing. And the first thing I'm going to do is to record my message from either a microphone or a line in input. So I'm going to select my source, I'm going to record a single mono channel of audio and then I'm just going to hit the record button and say my message. The code for the lock is one, two, three, four. And now you can see it's displaying a waveform of the audio I've just recorded. And if you wanted to play it back, you can hit the play button. The code for the lock is one, two, three, four. And now we're just going to edit it to prepare it for playback. So the first thing I notice is that it's got some extra silence at the beginning and end of the track and we're going to crop that out. So you just drag your mouse over to select that at the end, edit, delete, and at the beginning, edit, delete. And now I've got my trimmed track, I'm going to create another copy of it. So I'm going to go select all, edit, duplicate. So now I've got two identical audio tracks on top of each other and these are going to be the sound files that we play on each device. Now just to work through this example I'm just going to do it with two tracks but you can split your audio up across as many different devices as you want. You simply repeat that duplicate step to create another copy. So if I were to drag over this one again and do edit duplicate I've now got three copies. And the process is going to be exactly the same however many tracks you have. So I'm just going to show you with two because that's going to be a bit quicker to do. And now we get on to the fun bit, which is where we're going to selectively remove sections of audio from each track so that no one individually contains all of the information the players need. And there's just a couple of points to note as you do this. The first thing I'd recommend is that the section at the very start of the message, I recommend you keep that intact across all of the tracks. So in this example here, it's this little introductory bit where I just say the code for the lock is, and then before I say the numbers. And the reason for doing that is that if all of the tracks start the same way, that will help players to realize that they all form part of the same message and it will also give them a point of reference to let them know whether they successfully synchronized playback across all of the devices. And then the next point is as you go on to remove the audio, so the numbers which I read out at the end, you don't just want to cut them out. If I select this bit here, to, which is the number 2, and did edit cut, what would happen is that this track here has been squished up because that bit's been removed and it now no longer lines up with the rest of the playback. So instead of cutting bits of audio out what we're going to do is go to the generate menu and we're going to replace them either with noise or with silence. If you wanted to you could replace them with any other audio sound effect instead. You could have a klaxon horn or a police car or something like that but these are the, the easiest examples to demonstrate. So if I just go to silence for this one with the number which I want to replace highlighted, it's automatically going to generate the right amount of silence to cover that section of the track. So I just click Generate. 
and it's gone. Then I can come to this track, let's select a different number, once again go generate silence and we'll replace that number. Now perhaps if I go to uh, this one at the end of this track and instead of silence this time let's generate uh, some noise. So um, there's several different noise generators, white noise is the thing that's associated with static so let's just go for a basic white noise. I don't want it to be too loud because that can be quite jarring and actually make it hard for players to hear the correct number over the top so I just want quite low amplitude here. Generate and for this very first number at the beginning one yep yeah, that's the number one just checking um, so we're going to replace it on this track and this time let's replace it with a tone so replace it with a sine wave uh, again very low amplitude we don't want anything that's actually going to obscure the correct audio uh, let's just generate that okay so having done that you can preview what each track individually sounds like by hitting the solo button here and then if I just rewind to the beginning and hit play this will just be track number one the code for the lock is one three and if you just want to listen to track number two and hit the solo here the code for the lock is two four and if you want to listen to what everything would like all together, you uncheck all the solos and you can hit the play button now. The code for the lock is one, two, three, four. And you can do further edits if you want. You can do a whole lot of effects here. You can make it sound like you're in a cave or distorted. You can adjust the amplitude, uh, the bass and the treble. Just make everything sound great. And when you're really happy with it, what you need to do is to go to File, Export Multiple. And what this will do is this will export each of these audio tracks into a separate WAV or MP3 file in this directory here. Click Export. You'll get to add some metadata, but we're not actually going to use that. And you'll see it's generated these two files for me. So all you need to do is copy each of these output files onto separate SD cards, insert those into the GPD2486 modules of the corresponding devices, and you're ready to go. So that just about brings me to the end of this tutorial. I hope you found it interesting or useful, and perhaps it gave you some new ideas for puzzles you could use in an escape room. I've deliberately kept the styling of these boxes very simple. You can see it's just a MDF and then I've simply screwed the components into the back of the boxes there. I 3D printed a few of the mounts, so the speaker grill on the front here and also the mount that's holding the speaker on the back and I will publish the 3D models which I used if you'd like to make use of them in your own designs. But really you could create these in many different styles to fit whatever theme your escape room game is. As always I want to say thank you so much to all my Patreon supporters who enable me to create these tutorial videos every month. I really enjoy making them and I hope you enjoy watching them too. Thank you as always for your ongoing support. If you would like to support me to help make more tutorials in the future please do head over and check out my Patreon page. If not, you can always watch them here on YouTube anyway, and if you subscribe to this channel, you will see the latest tutorials as I publish them. Other than that, I just want to say, if you have any questions or comments, write them below, and thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers, bye.